start? Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, everybody, for coming today. Uh, it's nice to see a good number of people here for this 60 minutes workshop. Uh, on the hand of straight away to Emily and James, who are going to lead, it, lead uh, us off. And uh, if you do have any questions, just wait for the microphone as it comes around. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll just be reminding them towards the end just to, uh, to finish on time. But uh, yeah. over to you. So, thank you. So uh, thank you all for, for coming. Um, yes, my name is Emily. Um, uh, so the this is going to be one of those sessions where what was advertised in the abstract is slightly changed um, because uh, so our original intention was what we were going to do was was do a workshop, um, which was kind of almost like a live coding session where we went through R and everything like that. We then realized after uh, submitting the abstract that actually it, it wasn't a sign up workshop and, and so on. So actually getting people to come with the technology was not um uh in, entirely possible so what we're going to do instead is rather than do that kind of workshop where we go through like line by line actually how to do the code what we thought instead would be useful is to go through the tutorials um that we have created and basically explain what is possible in terms of analyzing uh lecture capture uh data using r um, and then we also thought what might be really useful um, is just to have kind of for the last 15 minutes or so is to have a discussion about the use of learning analytic data. So my um, primary research area is lecture capture. So that's um, what I, I do um, my research on. Um, and it's it, it's a really bizarre area to do research on because I thought that we had kind of finished having some of the conversations about should you record your lectures and stuff. Um, I thought COVID had kind of taken care of that. Um, and no, we're back. We're back where we were in 2015 in terms of because attendance and engagement has been problematic over the last year. We're now seeing those calls again to get rid of recordings. Um, and I actually think that that using analytic data has is, is really important that we do uh, robust research. So this is a very long winded introduction. What's going to happen is James is going to do um, give you an overview of our project. So I should really say uh, we're funded by uh, Echo 360 uh, for this project as part of the Echo 360 Champions grant. Is that the, yes? Getting it right. Um, so James is just going to kind of give a description of that. We'll then um, walk through the um, tutorials that we've developed uh, yeah. to show what we think is possible uh, in terms of um, how you can use the analytic data Echo provides. And then we'll have a discussion if that all sounds uh, okay. So thank you for coming with us on this. <laughs> I was just, I was for our workshop. Oh, cool. cool. So I'm just going to introduce like what what the project's about, what we're trying to do. Um, so me and Emily are both psychology lecturers. So we've been like the butt of many jokes like last couple of days of all the learning technologists say like um, complaining about how lecturers don't listen and like all the technological <laughs> problems like they cause. So hopefully it will be like a nice little palette cleanser and a like slightly different uh slightly different presentation than some of the other things so we applied for this grant and emily's research is focused on lecture capture and what we're trying to do and i think i'm going to slide too close what we're trying to do is for the people who do this stuff and we're really into it it almost comes second nature about being able to look at it see what you can use it for try and look at markers of engagement of students um, with learning materials. But then what we was interested in is, do people actually know what's there? So are they aware of what information is there? Do they know the tools that are available to them? Do they know what they can use? And once we have that, trying to think about what, if we know what you do know, what, what don't you know? So what we was trying to do is to get to a point of being able to develop resources to try and target the barriers that we sort of identified in people. Um, and this is where our tutorials come in. Of In uh, the psychology department at Glasgow, we put a big emphasis on data skills. So being able to analyze data, being able to wrangle data and, uh, and work with it. So we wanted to use the same sort of things we teach our students to demonstrate how you can work with this kind of data. So for anyone not, not familiar, hopefully uh, it is, but just to get everyone on the same page, this is the sort of data we're talking about. So different um, different bits of software, like there's uh, different options, but at Glasgow, we use Echo360. So to either capture lectures live or record lectures um, and upload them. So once you see that, you can have an overview like this. So this is one of my courses on research methods. And you can essentially see like how much 
uh, students use it. So the bars are like how many views they have across the months. It tells you how many unique views there are, how many total views there are, that sort of thing. But then you can also download the data. So this is like Echo, Echo's um, little dashboard, and that's what they provide. If you click on your library, if you have it at your institution, this is what you can um, this is what you can see. And I guess one of the other things to highlight, also in our focus groups, which I'll talk about in a second, this might differ depending on your role. So because we're lecturers, we kind of see this lecture facing version where for your lectures, for the things you've uploaded, these are the kind of statistics behind it. But when we start interviewing learning technologists and they might have oversight over not just one course, they might have oversight over a whole college, over a whole university, that can differ slightly. But then if you do download it, this is the sort of thing you get out of it. So you can get it to an Excel file. The thing I have deleted from here uh, is student names. Uh, obviously, we don't want to get GDPR'd uh, and uh, kicked out. So sort of deleting that information, but that is the only thing missing from here. So you get like a student by student overview of how many times they've viewed a given video, how long on average, how long in total they've seen these videos. So this is the kind of data we're talking about and what we're trying to work with. So for our little project, we did three focus groups, uh, 11 people spread across them, and it was a mix of lecturers, um, but then predominantly learning technologists was interesting. So I'm a little bit more new to this kind of research, this kind of area. So it was very interesting seeing the perspectives of learning technologists. People work more behind the scenes on facilitating this stuff rather than um, the sort of lectures we normally used to like discussing things with. So most like one of the main things that came out of it was particularly for the lecturers, but even some of the learning technologists almost never used the data had no real idea of like where it would come from, what they could do with it, uh, and the possibilities around it. Um, the only thing they really did was they would look at the dashboard, see X number of students viewed it, and then move on. Um, some had much more uh, in-depth understanding. So because Emily shared it, it was some of the people who, uh, the networks of people who are interested in like captured data. Uh, and one of the main things that came out of it was it's this very broad level view, which is fine if you're looking after sort of general patterns, but if you were interested in answering more specific research questions, you don't really get like individual student view data. So it's just this very aggregate version. And some people, there is actually more granular data behind the scenes. So you can access the API and look at more granular data, but you need quite a high level technological understanding to be able to access that and make, and make use of it. So from this rather than having some very fancy here's how you can do this very specific thing because we saw these barriers that people were just not as familiar with it we just wanted to demonstrate in these tutorials how you can work with this data so how you can read it in how you can um, wrangle it to put it into different formats how you can combine it with other data sources so for example for a vle we work with moodle um, so being able to get data from Moodle, combine it with what you have with Echo 360, um, and to try and answer different research questions. So after the focus group, together with our colleagues in maths and stats, developed these tutorials on just a general overview of what the data is, um, sort of exploring video course level data. So almost trying to recreate those dashboard visualizations you get. So just like your bar charts of how many views there are across videos, across time, combining it with other sources of data, which we feel is probably the most valuable and sort of novel approaches to it. Um, and then one of the things that I did, because it's talking about I deleted the student names off it, typically it's very difficult to work with student level data. So Emily has horror stories of trying to apply for ethics to work with this data from them because it's so sensitive at times. So depending on how detailed you get it, there's lots of privacy concerns behind it. So one of the things we also will include is so it's not something we was going to focus on today, but different ways you can try and work with this kind of data using something called like synthetic data to essentially preserve the relationships but it's not the real students data anymore so it's one way it's like when you have big uh, genetic databases it's one of the ways that you can still share it and work with it but it has fewer privacy concerns if you're just sharing their data so we were gonna like get people to vote on the approach but like i said when we sort of recognize 
most people don't have a laptop. They didn't have like detailed instructions on what to come with. We sort of changed the approach a little bit. So we're more just going to give you an overview of what we've prepared, the possibilities, and then seeing what, um, what people think, um, and then getting more of a little discussion going towards the end. So pass back over to Emily. Thank you. Um, just before uh, we go any further, can you be my roving mic? Yeah, please? of course. Um, has anyone used Lectric? It doesn't have to be Echo 360, but has anyone actually used the the learning analytic data that comes from from Echo or any other kind of lecture capture um, to do any kind of analysis? Um, did, did you? Can you run over there? Um, how how have you used it? I'd just be really interested uh, to know. <laughs> so I struggle to do the things that I want to with the data that I can access easily through the interface. But I would so I, I'm uh, in a faculty ed tech lab as a data analyst. And one of the things I was trying to do was for a year convener who wanted to know during the pandemic whether the lectures that they had pre-recorded and then asked students to watch were in total for a module the same kind of length as if they were giving 50 minute lectures and whether the students viewing behavior was or or how they how it differed between um what they might do if they were watching a lecture and then mm -hmm. re-watching bits of it oh, sorry if they were having a face-to-face -face lecture and re-watching bits so whether their kind of behavior when they were just viewing the pre-recorded material mm -hmm. was very different yeah. okay that's really yeah and so were you able to to do all that or just uh, it? it never got finished because <laughs> <laughs> they're sort of, sort of fitting it in around lots of other things yeah because um one of the bits of information that i wanted which was just the length of the recordings yeah <laughs> wasn't um very easy to get and um, that sounds really stupid, but it just wasn't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the, the 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 data you can get from the Echo dashboard does actually have. Yeah. I was gonna say, if you go back yeah. a couple of. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. Best. There is a. If you look at column D, like yeah. that's one of the things that you. It's, it's, it's you in the analysis but... there. Um, is there anyone else has 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 used it for any kind of? <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna hover over back. <laughs> I've, I've used it to my previous institution, uh, but both of them are Panopto. Uh, okay. I, in this particular instance, I was actually doing a study on the VLE and I was looking at the correlation between exam results and the amount of time they spend in the VLE. And I noticed that there's actually, uh, it's, across the cohort, it's a positive correlation, but if you go above, beyond, double the average amount of time that people spend in there, it actually becomes an inverse correlation. Yeah. Um, uh, so I was interested to see if the same Thing happened in the same module with the Panopto videos, mm -hmm. and it didn't. So uh, actually, the the correlation stayed uh, positive. Uh, okay. That... Uh, uh, beyond. So yeah. So so uh, that, uh, that's I'm I'm that's an early part of the project, and I'm still investigating the how and why. Yeah. No, that's that's really interesting. I'd be really, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if if that gets a completion, send me it, please. Um, yeah, so there's not, I think one of the things um, as, as that came out of the focus groups was there isn't really that awareness that you can use this data. And I think for lecture capture particularly, because it's one of those, it's this really emotive technology that when it comes to academics, they it, it's the thing that people will talk about banning and stuff without actually realizing that they have access to all of this data. Um, so this is what we wanted to try and give people easier ways to to show that you can actually try and evidence some of the things you have these emotional uh, reactions about. Um, and we also wanted to do it in R because it's open access and open source and, and everything like that. So we have um, written uh, these uh, tutorials. Um, it's uh, I, James, do you have is the, the slides have the link on them? Uh, the slides don't, but I can get it up in a second. I think that the link is actually in the the abstract. Of yes. The, yeah. So the, the link to the tutorials and is in the abstract of the talks. It's on the the, the alt conference program. Um, so we've got uh, three tutorials uh, in in total. Um, so the first one is just about getting started with Echo three hundred and sixty data. So what this is doing, this tutorial is showing what you can do with that spreadsheet that you download from Echo. So the dashboard that Echo gives you. 
um, with with the bars and, and stuff, you can then download the data as an Excel file, as a, a CSV file. The first tutorial that we've written is really just about almost essentially recreating the dashboard. How can you, working on your own computer, take the CSV file and recreate um, some of those um, uh, analyses? Um, so, for example, I'm just trying to find um, this is the uh, like the, the, the total views. Um, so just uh, giving um, this is how many times students watched uh, the videos. Um, and actually what you can see is most students only ever watch the videos once. OK, that's what that, that graph is showing. You could get that from the Echo 360 dashboard. This isn't actually giving you anything more um, than you would get. But the point is that you are doing it with um uh the the data that you are able uh to download um so that first tutorial is really just very very it's yeah it, it's really just showing you how to do um what you can already do um on your own the second and third tutorials then try and go a little bit further um and th there is a problem with the data it is it does lack granularity okay I would like to do analyses on how often students pause the recording. Okay. That to me is one of the biggest questions. That to me is, is like, if I could, I don't have the time, the budget, or I don't want any more the expertise to do this. But for me, pausing is the big issue because I hear my first years telling me that it's taken them three hours to watch a one hour video. Um, so I know that that data is available in the API. If you go behind the scenes, it's not available and what's kind of uh, done with the dashboard. But anyway, there is still a lot of stuff that you can do with the data that's freely available um, that you couldn't do in the dashboard. You need to be able to do a little bit more wrangling uh, with it. Um, so let me just. Um, so one of the things you can do is work with time and date data. Now, if any of you have I uh, have any experience of uh, working in R, you will know that working with time and date data in R is awful. Um, uh, it's it, it can be really complicated. Thankfully, um, there's packages from the Tidyverse um, that have uh, made this um, a little bit easier. Um, but for example, this is what you wanted. So this is a graph of um, the duration in minutes of each video. So these is uh, James's videos. So this is week one to nine or video one to nine. I can't remember if it was yeah. a week. Um, so the duration uh, in in minutes there. So I don't know what happened to you in week five. Maybe just gave up. Just like, yeah, it's around like we, we have record reading week. So it's probably about reading week when it's just like having that lull. And <laughs> yeah, um, but because you've got the full power of R, you can choose how you visualize the, that data. So this is the same data. It's just as a line graph uh, or um, a bar chart. Um, but you can also then, for example, um, because you can wrangle uh, the data, um, this is the, what this analysis is doing is pulling out the months that the video was last viewed on. So again, it's a little bit blunt, okay? Um, but this is like the last time the video was viewed was January, February, uh, and so on. And this, it was a uh, second semester course, I assume. Um, I think this is our ODL, so it kind of spans the whole year. The, the videos would have been done in January. So you can see that they're, they're not really watching them beyond uh, the, the point. Um, at which um, the you know the, the week. Uh, Can I check another one, yeah. please? Um, people who just look at the video and you don't know what they're watching. Um, so the question was, are these people who have, um, can you tell if they've just viewed the video or watched all of it? So this is just views. This is just kind of very blunt number of views. There is then data about their average viewing time, okay. which I'll come to. Uh, which bits of the video have most attention? Not so. The question was not which bits of the video um, have been uh, watched. Um, I think you can get that from the API if you get the call, but it's not available just through um, the the dashboard. One of the quite nice things about being able to import the data and use it in R is that you can then actually. Um, use so this is a package called ggplotly um, and this gives you interactive um, graphs so this is the same one but if you hover over them it will come up with um, a count so 
1,339 views were in, in January and so on. And you can customize these graphs to be interactive, which if you're trying to kind of produce something you could give to academics to show them, to allow them to interact with their data, I think this would be a really, really nice way of doing it. We've got some more that are a little bit fancier uh, in, in a second. Um, that kind of stuff is, is what's already in the dashboard, but there's, like I said, you can, you can go uh, beyond it. So what this analysis is, is doing here is it's looking at the duration of the video. So let's say the video is 13 minutes, 55 seconds. It's then looking at how long that student watched that video for on average. It's, it's not, again, it's, it's lacking granularity. So for example, if the student had watched the video twice, you would get an average view time of 13 minutes and 55 seconds. You don't actually know how long they watched it for on education. Um, so it, it's a bit blunt. But what we then did was look at, um, so we created a variable called time difference. So this is the difference between the average view time and the full length of the video. So it's basically you can figure out what percent of the video do people on average uh, watch. Um, and, and because we can kind of transform that, you can see it um, uh, visually. So what this tells you is most people, there's zero difference between the total length of the video and how much they watched. So most people are watching it in full. But we also have people who are, you can see, the, so the further along we get with this graph, the less of the video they're watching, the bigger the difference is between the total length of the video um, and how much they're watching. Um, we could also make this uh, interactive. So 710 people, zero time difference, uh, whereas um, seven minutes or 71 people had a time difference. Sorry, Andy, so if they've watched it more than once, do they then become a new data point? That's why it's all minus. So, nope. so right. um, <laughs> the... Let's see. Um, this is gonna... Yeah, so what you're finding about, so to answer it a little bit, so... The data you get out of it is student level, so it's aggregated to individual students. So if a student watches it once, it's perfect because the average time is the time it watched it. But if they watch it more than one time, you, there is another variable in there that is the total view time, and that will go above the duration because it's how much they've watched it in total. Yeah. Um, but and then the average is somewhere in the middle of that, but it also tells you like their total views. So you can see if it's one view, like the top row, yeah, it the total view time is the same as the average view time because that's all there is to go on. But as soon as it gets to two or more, yeah. it starts to get more complicated, yeah, yeah. So, for example, this person has viewed the video, but can I just say these names are simulated, these names are made up. James did something with R, I don't really understand, but it was great. <laughs> Um, so um, this person has watched the video four times. Their total viewing time is eight minutes. Uh, so their average viewing time is two minutes. Okay, you don't know how many, well, how long they watched it for in each unique time. It is just one row of data. If you go into the API and you can get full access to the data, you would have that granularity. But in terms of what's available straight away it is a bit of a blunt uh, tool so you do have to be careful about some of the conclusions yeah um this is also um so what i did with this this plot here is looked at percent so obviously um if you if you if you think about kind of the difference between the average viewing time and the total viewing time kind of it does really matter how long the video is like if you miss one minute of a one hour video that's less bad than missing one minute of a two minute video okay so it, it does matter so instead i was able to wrangle the data into percent so this is actually what percentage of the video on average with that that caveat that people watched um and you can see here um we're kind of about 75% on average is, is what people make it through uh, for a video. Week five, it was a shorter video, so you get a higher uh, percentage. Um, but this is the kind of, I think what's really um, 
important about actually downloading the data and doing the analysis yourself is you can use it to tell the story you need to tell. And what that story is really depends on what argument you're facing. And I don't mean story as in kind of fabricating, you know, whatever, but we all have, there's always different reasons why you need to be analyzing um, uh, this data. Um, so uh, it's also like, this is the stuff that's available um, uh, through the dashboard as well. So, uh, the Echo 360 dashboard. So total number uh, of views uh, per video. Um, that's fairly uh, uh, blunt, but we can also then wrangle that into the total number of unique student views. So whilst you can't separate out um, how long each view was, you can say how many unique views there were, um, which can be um, uh, quite helpful. Um, that's just doing that. Uh, so let me just get, sorry, was there a question? No, I'm just clarifying for it. Yeah. Um, so this is this may be a, a good example of something that's a little bit more advanced in terms of using this um, plotly. I so I don't know how to get the the thing down, and I'm so. okay. Yeah. Um, but this is uh, an example of a, a more advanced interactive plot where we're able to overlay quite a bit of information on the plot. So, for example, this is um, let's see if I can. That's maybe. Uh, this is the unique views per video. So along the bottom, we've got video one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, and then we can overlay with the, um, the interactive plot. So this is video one, uh, total views was 291. The unique views was 195. The duration was 13 minutes and 11 seconds. And the average view time was was nine minutes. So you can get a lot of information into this dashboard. And again, depending on the story you want to tell. Um, and it doesn't actually take that much code. I'm not going to go through this code because it's now not the point of the session. But that's the R code that makes that plot. It's not that difficult um, in terms of, of the amount it takes um, and very, very customizable. Um, this is also another one where we have both the repeated uh, views and the, the unique views uh, plotted um, uh, as well. Um, da, 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 da. Right. Where I think this, so I quite, I, I love a graph, love a good graph. Uh, genuinely will do data visualization for fun. Um, I'm really fun to live with. Um, but um, I think where the analytic data really comes into its own is being able to combine it with other sources of data. And this is really where the research is going to come from, because it's not actually that useful just to look at how many views you have. You want to compare it to, you know, exam creator or, or attendance. That would be, you know, obviously uh, one of the big ones. Um, so by using R, by downloading uh, the CSV file and doing it in R, you can then combine it. So what we've done in this tutorial um, is combined it with scores on a multiple choice quiz. So these, uh, the, the echo data that we have is data from uh, James's research methods uh, course, which has you know, the statistics and everything. Um, and we also have the data from the multiple choice quizzes from Moodle. So two completely different sources uh, of data. Um, the way in which um, uh, the way in which R does this uh, is uh, through joins. So through relational joins. And basically all you need is for those two data sets to have one source of data in common. So in this example, um, the ECHO uh, uh, dashboard and Moodle both have the student's email address. It's probably going to be an email address or a, you know, a student ID, anything like that. But you just needed to have that source of data in common. And then you can join together anything. OK, so what we can do is we can take the lecture data and we can take the uh, multiple choice data um, and, and merge it. Um, and there's a bunch of different joins you can do. So you can just keep the rows where you have data in both. So you 
it might be that a student hasn't watched any recordings, but they have done the quiz. So you can choose whether or not to keep all of that or just have, you know, people who have um, uh, complete uh, data sets. Um, sorry, I'm just going to skip through this here. So doing this, and again, I should just highlight, this is simulated data. The relationships in here are based on the relationships that were in the real data. Okay, so this is kind of, this is what we found from our course, but it's just, it's been, it's like a photocopy of a photocopy, uh, if you will, in terms of the data. But for example, doing this, we were able to plot the relationship between how many times uh, students had viewed the video. So that's on the x-axis there and then their score on uh, the multiple uh, choice. This is obviously an incredibly uh, simple um, uh, analysis, um, but you know, in terms of getting uh, the, the basic principles, um, you can see the applicability of this kind of you know, wider, which is that if you can combine this learner analytic data with any other form of information that you have, it then becomes very powerful in terms of trying to run uh, predictive models uh, and trying to see what the relationships um, are. Um, and we also have, again, the um, uh, interactive, Inter thank you, the, the interactive graph so that you can um, have a look at, you know, for example, that one there, they got 100% on the MCQ. It's a stats MCQ, so that does happen uh, with, with 16 uh, uh, views and so on um, and then we're able to start running some we've just done uh, a, a correlation here which was not significant but it then allows you uh, to do that um, I was really really surprised when we did the focus groups at how few people were aware of it um, and then I suppose I think about my own behavior as a lecturer as a, like if I separate out Emily, the researcher, from Emily, the lecturer. As a researcher, I'm really interested in this. As a lecturer, when was the last time I went and looked <laughs> at my analytics? And I think, I don't know. The only time I ever would do it is when there's a problem. So when someone comes to me and says, oh, attendance was bad today, are they watching the video? That's, that's normally the thing, like, are they watching the video? Um, and I think so one of the things we wanted to do with this was to try and highlight that you do actually have more information than you might think. And I think sometimes with academics, they will knee jerk and say, oh, well, we need, we need data, we need evidence. And it's actually, they have it available to them. It's there. So we were trying to make this, um, uh, we were trying to write tutorials so that people could actually use the data they have to help inform their learning and teaching practice because it does tend to be uh, such an emotive topic. I will say that in terms of um, what's lacking from the data, um, that, that granularity does cause issues. And I would be really interested to hear if anyone has any thoughts about what you would like to do. So for example, I think pausing is a really big, um, really big issue. And for the echo data, not knowing when each view was so you know the last view but you don't know when each view was and so for example I think one of the things that would be really useful from a research perspective is to be able to look at um, uh, distributed practice so I want to know not when it was the last time they viewed it I want to know the first time they viewed it okay because actually to me that's a bigger thing which is that if you if I know that the last time a student viewed the video was two days before the exam, I could be like, right, that could be any kind of student. If I know that the first time they viewed it was two days before the exam, that tells me something very different. So there is that lack of granularity does um, cause some issues in terms of what we can do with it. And I know different platforms have different amounts of information and, and data that are kind of... Uh, readily available. So I suppose, I think what would be kind of useful from, from what we've presented that here is just to really open it up to a discussion, which is if you had the time, the skills and the data, what would you like to do with it? And do you think in terms of your roles, I mean, I'm, 
an academic, surrounded by academics. Um, how do you see this being able to help your roles as well? Um, or what would you like to do with it? Or how do you think we could actually try and get people to be more aware of, of what they have? Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the roving mic. You're a lovely assistant, James. Yes, it's not. I think from my point of view, I'm I'm in I'm a learning designer. And so it wouldn't be so much about lecture capture because I design online, fully online courses, mm -hmm. but knowing the engagement data in particular types of interactive activity, um, as well as videos, because we can see right, what actually works, what do the learners actually do? Yeah. Are they engaging with these beautiful interactives that we've created or are they not? And then that will then inform how we design in future. So that's the kind of data that I would like to use and then visualize in R so mm -hmm. that we can then see the trends and then yeah make decisions as to design in relation to that really yeah and i i, I suppose what, what are your thoughts on i am i love working in r and i think the power of r is you know even just with extremely blunt data what you're actually able to do with it you can do quite a lot because you can rip it apart and put it back together how you want is that actually a barrier though or is it a barrier that is just inevitable because you have to be able to do it like this. Like, would a dashboard be better? Um, I mean, I quite like R personally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I've used R visualization before. Yeah. And I think the ability to, to join data. So if this person engaged more with the learning activities that we created, did that then have an impact on their um, eventual outcomes? Did they score more highly in their exams? Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. So, um, cause it could be that not many people engage, but the people that do get higher marks, in which case we need to leave it in because it's actually a useful activity. So yeah. I think R allows us to make those kinds of connections yeah. uh, that we can then inform our processes going forward. So I, I love R. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going yeah. to. I won't say anything bad about it. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know R um, <laughs> yet. I'm about to start a course, which it's central to, which is what caught my eye. I suppose my observation on this is that you two are in kind of numerate disciplines mm -hmm. so the idea that a uh, good analysis of lecture capture data would help yeah your colleagues understand better what's working what isn't isn't mad but if you're talking about academics in other fields all that one could really hope for is for lecture capture suppliers to provide much better dashboards that non numerity people can draw inferences from mm. and the other thing that just struck me listening to this is that w working out what's what what is the inference that can be drawn from data when presented like this yeah that's an incredibly important facet of it and isn't always obvious yeah and that sometimes people who are data aware get very kind of excited about the fact that they can present the data visually Mm -hmm. But the really difficult thing is working out the inferences that can be drawn yeah. from it. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. And then it kind of comes back to in terms of learning analytics. I mean, I know at Glasgow we have, I mean, the amount of data that we are collecting on a daily basis is just absolutely unreal. But I don't, I don't know where it goes. I don't know what what's done with it. And in terms of a practical um, level, like, is this something? <laughs> do you know? We've, so we've got planning insights and analytics that do all our, our data for us and is it the case that i don't know so if, if a lecturer wants to sitting on the, you're sitting on yeah the yes uh, the gold density in the ore is very low and with the right tools the gold can be extracted from the gold mine yeah. and used and yeah but it's working out what are the tools to do that and how to present the output in a way that's the full spectrum of people who need to take decisions uh, can use. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge frustration of mine in terms of lecture capture research. And I haven't been able to overcome it myself. Is that like, I know we have the data to kind of conclusively 
show people what the impact of attendance and recording usage is. We, the data is there, but getting access to it and doing it on, on a scale that's useful when you don't just have, you know, like 150 student opt-in samples is incredibly difficult. So yeah, trying to mine that for, for everybody is, uh, yeah, I, I, I see the point in terms of we're very quantitatively minded in the department and that makes it an easier sell. Hi, um, thanks very, that's really interesting. I am also not familiar with R. Um, I think moving away from learning analytics, but more to do with kind of content management and um, information that can help an academic team to enhance their learning mm -hmm. provision or teaching provision. Um, I think this data, well, this tool could be used to help teams to review their content on a summer basis yeah. so one of the things that we do is we provide reports to you know year leads block leads um who want to review their content when they're thinking about refreshing it for the following year so that they can see which content has been most actively in, yeah. you know watched and what which you know which lectures haven't had that much attention um, particularly when you're looking at pre-recorded content mm -hmm. as opposed to a lecture capture recording, yeah. um, that's different. But yeah, I think it could be very useful to provide a dashboard for course teams looking at archiving old stuff and replacing and refreshing it. So I know, I mean, with, with R, it's not something I have done um, myself, um, but you can make dashboards in R using something called Shiny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, which is slightly beyond me. Um, but so it is actually possible to take the data analysis and then put it into a format that other people could use it as a dashboard. Mm -hmm. It would take learning. Yeah. Uh, uh, but certainly, to be honest with you, ChatGPT has made coding <laughs> yeah. a lot. Yeah. I mean, I suppose my question is really about the kind of privacy then. So, okay, you get over the hurdles and you learn the tools to create, you know, to do the analysis, to create the dashboard. You want to then share it with team A or team B but you don't want that data to be publicly available. So yeah. how do you, you know, present those dashboards behind password protected screens that then becomes more yeah. complicated? I mean, I suppose Power BI would be another option. I don't use it myself, but I believe you can use R within Power BI. So, yeah. Um, so that would, be, and then I think you could restrict access um, through that. Um, it's just to to plug our materials. So the address for this is sciteachr.github.io. Um, if you if you don't know R and you'd like to know R, um, applied data skills is I would say probably the best starting point. So this is um, my course. Um, uh, it's a micro credential. It's a ten week micro credential. So it's aimed at um, yeah, the non-academics. Um, it's actually most people who take the course are in the NHS, uh, but that goes from zero to uh, fully reproducible um, uh, reports and, and visualizations and stuff. Um, and it also has all of the this walkthrough videos and everything. They're mostly my face, I apologize. Um, uh, yeah, but the, the entire course is, is open access. So if you want to learn R, then that's, I'm told it's, it's okay, <laughs> as a course. Uh, yeah. If you take a visualization using R for research, you don't need that. No, so that is another, that's an, an, another one of mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so the, the full course is applied data skills. Data visualization using R for researchers who use R as, as a paper. So that's just, it's quite a short thing. The applied data skills is like a full 10 week, 10 credit course um, that, that goes from, from nothing to, yeah. If you're domiciled in Scotland, it's free, but that probably doesn't help that many people here. <laughs> that well, so this one is everything's available online. If if you are domiciled in Scotland and you wanted to actually get the credits for it, it would be free. I think it's seven hundred pounds to sign up for it if you're if you're not Scottish. Um, uh, but everything's there, so we we just make everything open access, and it's all got a CC BY license as well. So actually, if you want to steal it, that's also fine. I like our question. Yes. Um, probably not so much a question as a ramb rambling thoughts, but um, I kind of thinking back as well to what Amory Scott was saying yesterday in terms of 
small steps. And I think you we you've... didn't get here until the last time because of coming from Scotland. So <laughs> highly, highly recommend watching. Yeah. You can watch it online. It's available. And so she's in a leadership role, and you know, part of her her guidance is looking at those small steps. Yeah. And I think you've what you've done here is you've got that small step, and I think it's. Um, I think you're you're seeing value from this in terms of interpreting, mm. analyzing the data, um, and I think it would, you know, for your institution, you know, it's presenting this as we've got this small step. We think yeah. it's beneficial. You know, showing that there, you know, in terms of going forward, there's there's value yeah. in terms of you know improving the educational experience um, and looking at where you go next as part of that um because i appreciate you know something like data governance is a really complex area but i think it does for institutions there's a real opportunity and to do stuff with data in a controlled way that isn't also um making very small gatekeepers and that's something yeah. my wife works in higher education and it's the frustration i hear from her every day it's like they've got a data lake but they yeah. they don't have the access or the skills to fully utilize it i think data skills are so important does it moving away from from lecture capture stuff now but it's basically the same skills that are yeah. in this tutorial is um so one of the things i care a lot about is about widening participation and actually one of the things i've been able to do because of the data i have available and because of my data skills is to merge a couple of different forms of data that we have to show that actually some of our policies are disadvantaging our md20 smid20 students um and that's only possible because we've been able to to combine these things and wrangle them in our Another thing we've been doing, I know everyone's been doing it over the last year, is about extensions and late submissions and trying to get that number down. And, and one of the things I've been able to do is to actually look at the proportion of late submissions and extensions for the last four years, then combine that with the extension data so I can say who actually had an extension versus just submitted late. That's then helping to inform our practice and, and you know various interventions and looking at stuff from Moodle. And it's all the same underlying skills. So I think if you can kind of convince people to upskill and to kind of show them, open the door into how you can use the lake <laughs> of data that is all the lecture capture stuff, Moodle, Canvas, everything, and give them relatively basic data skills, it, it opens up so much. I actually remember a couple of years ago, another old conference where University of Manchester were looking at R for analysis of the NSS mm -hmm. um, data. And I think what was, you know, they basically went to someone within the institution who did research on pterodons or flight patterns of pterodons, but they knew R. And mm -hmm. so I think that's one of the huge things within our education institutions is we we have people like you or other departments that know these tools inside out they're using them on a daily yeah. basis but as an institution we never tap into that yeah. but obviously they've got priorities of their own in terms of research and their own yeah. education delivery but i think there's so much untapped capability yeah uh, is finding ways of unlocking it i think it's a challenge so in glasgow we have we have very very distinct um so we have research and teaching so kind of traditional lecture then we also have the learning teaching scholarship track which is what me and james are on um and it's it's very very distinct in glasgow it's it's, yeah. it's one of the, the most i think um but one of the things i'm trying to do is kind of encourage those people who are more quantitatively minded to think about it in this way because that a lot of people I think struggle to find their scholarship area of research that's away from their field like you know if you are a biomedical scientist suddenly flipping over to educational research feels very foreign whereas if you actually go well you can apply all of your skills all of that statistical modeling that you have to these questions i think again it's that untapped pool of data untapped pool of of, of skills and knowledge that we're not very good at using Yep. Oh, 
it's just sorry, it's sorry. Sorry. Okay, okay. A time warning oh, okay sorry, thanks. um right complete data noob so i'm going to bite the bullet and yep. look completely um yeah um you mentioned the api when it comes to data granularity yeah um so all that extra data is available in the api mm -hmm. What's stopping using that? Is it because it's behind a paywall or you don't own it? Um, so what's going on there? Do you know the answer to that? <laughs> so you can extract it, but it's very hard to read. Yeah. You have to spend days sitting with you, showing you how to use the, the data. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it, it's accessible. Yeah. We from Echo can access it, uh -huh. but it could be raw data to an instructor or any academic it's so hard to uncode it right you have to work with them yeah. for weeks to, to actually get the real data okay yeah. no follow-up question thank you very much <laughs> yeah it's like in 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 our focus groups, like one of the academics, like one of the few academics we had, um, she does very similar research to Emily, and she had a similar thing where she had that expertise yeah. and she was struggling to access it. But do you know what SQL is like SQL? So it, yeah, it's in that. So it's like database language. So me and Emily, very strong quantitatively, but that's just like a different kettle for like the average academic, even when you know like data skills, never has to work with like databases, like proper databases. So it, it's just one of those, it's like an additional level of complex data management skills before you then can have the data to then work with and have to do the other stuff. Yeah. Oh, I think Darren then. Hi. So I've got a question that relates to the access to the API or getting more granular data. Do you have uh, Echo 360? reports that administrators within an institution can access that have more granular data because that's what i discovered was the case so we um i'm from imperial college in london and we use panopto and i discovered that our it department can get more useful reports to uh, wrangle for analyses than we can get through the user interface to extract yeah so we for example work with lsd and sometimes we get Question. Can we yeah. So, but is it something that can be readily accessed? So we've now got a system. So it's still not ideal because I would like to get data through the API, but we need a data engineer to work on that because it's technical, that level of uh, technical skill required. And then we'll sort out the interpreting what it means. Um, but we have got a halfway house where we've got some reports that are available to it that they're now running on a daily basis and we're pulling into a data lake and then creating into data tables that we could um, build reports from so is there something that they could set up that is that sort of system also possible so with the has, has access to certain data yeah. and does have access to much let's call it bigger data yeah and if the admins will ask about something specific you can compare it back Oh, so it might be worth asking whoever's has that admin role with it in Glasgow. Yeah. And that might give you access to some more data. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I think the yeah, so in terms of like as a researcher, I would that that's something I would definitely do as a kind of uh, as a course lecturer. I think there's like you just want it to be as easy as you just it just needs to be there. Like that's the yeah, the, that's yeah. So I think there's a yeah. So right. I, uh, I've got a follow on and that's um, so you talk I was sitting here wondering about whose role who who is whether it's better to have data analyst roles with which is kind of like what mine's supposed to be but yeah. I've really struggled getting access to the data that right. I want um, whether it's better to have roles like that if so that if it's not the vendor that's providing information in a dashboard that if there are bespoke things that a department want to look at mm. um, and combine, as you show, data from a VLE yeah. and data from a lecture capture system and marks data and all sorts of things, is it better to have skilled uh, data analysts within those departments that can work with the academic staff? Or I, I liked you the fact that you talked about having that scholarship pathway for mm -hmm. academics. Is that why you're, is that, why you've developed these um, uh, online 
tutorials yeah. so that it helps to support people to develop their own academic scholarship that's that's pathway. that's part of it is is that it's part of that i think in terms of is it better to have like a data analyst role or i would and this is this is not an expert opinion this is just my opinion um i kind of think both in that like you know that that whole thing if you can't expect everyone to be an expert at everything you need people whose jobs are just to do it right <laughs> um so i think there's definitely a need for more more data analyst roles because we have more need for that than than this capacity i also think there's an argument to be made for people giving people agency over their own data because if you can convince academics to care <laughs> about certain things it might you know and if they could actually see you know, the data behind it um so i think both i think if i had to pick one i'd probably go with the data analyst role because you'd rather do it right but i i think there's an argument for both i am conscious of the time and i think there was was the did you have a question? I think also just the advantage of being more in things. Now, I want to do with accessibility data. Yes. But I think that will upset people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's really important for me. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, can I just say one thing on like, the other thing? Yeah, though, like, yeah. And it's pretty much just to agree with you <laughs> and that not intentionally, like, not just to, not just to appease, but uh, the previous institution I worked at, um, they gave data through Power BI. So everyone had access to that. So what I think is quite important is if, like I said, like having a dedicated data analyst would be helpful because, um, just like what you touched on earlier, not me and people like me and Emily are like the, the exception rather than the norm. Like you're not going to get every, like even with our, within our department, you have a mix of skills in terms of being able to apply the data skills or even just the interest in it. So it's good having like a dedicated role for it. But then on the flip side, you kind of need like the skin in the game sort of thing where you kind of need to know what questions you want answering to be able to have useful kind of data. Because when I worked at my previous institution, we had like a similar kind of like data, anal uh, data analysis uh, collection sort of bit. And then they used to just dump it in this Power BI. And it's just like, right, go find your data. And it was so complicated, even like me as someone who teaches statistics as like a day job. It was just a nightmare, like trying to even just find the things that I was looking for. So you kind of almost need a bit of like curation of like, this is the sort of things that were useful. It goes back to what Emily said about the story to tell, not like manipulating a way that you get the answer you want, but just a focused, this is what, this is the, like the question I'm trying to answer. This is how I can, this is how I can hopefully answer it. That sort of thing. I am very, very conscious of time there. So I think we'll need to stop there. Um, but thank you for coming. That wasn't quite, the really structured session that we had in mind, but I hope it was still helpful. And as uh, and, and yeah, if, if you want any of the resources or anything like that, then please do get in touch. Quite happy to give everything away. Like that.